It's almost, I don't know if it's electric. All right, good morning. Didn't have to use three bottles of ibuprofen yesterday from doing a bunch of mulch, I hope. And uh, boy, the grounds look great, don't they? And uh, thank you so much again for all of the hard work on that. And, you know, uh, the previous time that we spread mulch, we did, uh, I picked it up in a dump truck. It would have been two years ago. We did not put fresh down last year. Uh, previous time was 16 yards of mulch. That's quite a bit of mulch. Uh, we did 20 yesterday. And so... 24, says Cecil, and uh, he was the guy hauling it. I am thankful that we did not do that with a wheelbarrow, and so that uh, is a grueling process. I will say this. I don't know what happened. I got the skid steer back. This is the way it always works, and I went to take it off the trailer, and the bucket will not lift. It's like, oh, great. Here we go again. So you can make that a matter of prayer. I uh, have absolutely no idea, nor does Jeff. We mess with it, mess with it, mess with it. And it's like, okay, well, this makes no sense. And so anyway, it's like, yeah, I'll let someone borrow something. They tear it up anyway. But uh, I do appreciate all of the work on things. I uh, would ask you to be in prayer for uh, this week. The uh, funeral for Jesse's mom is going to be on Thursday. And uh, please pray for that, just there's some spiritual needs that are there. Pray for wisdom and clarity of thought for me. Uh, everything is going to be at Sossaman's Funeral Home, so the visitation is at 1, the service is at 2. And so following that service, uh, we are going to be offering a meal for any of the family. That will be held here at the church. Heather is running that show. And so, I say show, uh, but anyway, uh, if you are interested in perhaps helping with that, you can talk to her on that, uh, but just please be in prayer uh, for that whole situation, and, and uh, we may or may not see Jessie today. Uh, she is in town, but there's a lot of needs with the family as well, and so she's trying to balance all of that, but certainly uh, a great opportunity to share the gospel, uh, and we look forward to that as well, but I would appreciate your prayers, and um, Brenda's sister has begun the chemo treatments, is that correct? Okay. All right, let's pray for that as well, and so uh, continue to be in prayer there. Good to have each one of you. Seems as though there was another thing I was supposed to mention, prayer rise, but I cannot think of what it is, so uh, we shall start Sunday school. <laughs> All right. You don't have anything? All right. Anyway, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you so much for your blessings to us. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to get together and to study your word. And I pray that you would give us insight and wisdom as we uh, seek to understand it, help us to apply it, help us to strive to be better Christians. And Lord, have a, a better testimony for you and just strive to be what you would have us to be. Thank you for all of the work that was able to be accomplished uh, yesterday. We pray your blessings on each one who uh, was involved in that. Lord, I know there were others who had hoped to be, but just simply were unable, and thank you for that also. I pray you would be with Jesse's mom, or the, the funeral with her mom this week. I pray that you would give wisdom, and, and Lord, that you would be working in the hearts even now, and preparing the seed and the soil, and just ask that uh, the seed of your word would fall into fertile ground, and I pray for just a wonderful opportunity. And uh, Lord, as we study your word today, I pray your blessings on it. I pray you would give us some insight as well. Help us again to strive to be what you would have us to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. I want to uh, continue our path to peace. I think that it's important that we understand that this is a... Um, path that involves a number of steps, a journey. I think sometimes we want to change one thing and expect immediate peace. It doesn't always work that way. Uh, and so there's a, a path that is there. What I want us to uh, focus on, and we're still going to be in verse number five, we've already covered verse four, where we were given our mindset as to how we're to respond to things that God allows. We find in verse five, to let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand, and that is a spirit of gentleness, a disposition uh, that is to be something that is known to everyone. And 
what I want us to understand out of all of this, and it's the same premise that we have been developing, but our outer disposition is a reflection of our inner reality. And if we are inwardly in turmoil, then most likely we are going to visibly demonstrate that. It might be in our actions, it might be in our reactions, it might be in our demeanor, our outlook, all sorts of ways. But if things are not right inside, more than likely things are not going to be right on the outside. We have observed several principles to this point. We saw, number one, that we need to first identify the hindrances, and then we saw, number two, that we need to maintain continual joy. These are the steps towards peace. Three, what we're looking at now was to reflect a gentle disposition. There are, again, several points now on this disposition. The first was that it is a reflection on the gospel. I do firmly believe that a carnal Christian is a very poor reflection of the gospel. And if we are poorly reflecting it naturally, we're going to struggle to advance it properly. We also saw, number two, the reality of hardship. I wish we could avoid that, but we simply cannot. Uh, it would be nice if we could avoid it. We would probably make the argument that if I could avoid all of the hardship, it sure would be a lot easier to maintain a proper inner disposition. Well, the reality is that we're not going to avoid it, and so we have to learn then to have this kind of a mindset even when we are in the midst of the struggles. And then we saw and began looking at, number three, the meaning of my moderation. What does this person look like? We saw that he is not overly insistent on his way. I challenge you with this idea that different is not always wrong. It might be, but it's not always wrong. It may just simply be uh, a different way of doing something. Now, there may be times when that's not the right way to do something, and in which case, obviously, uh, it is wrong. But it necessitates there be a tolerance of others. I'll talk more about that here in just a moment. Number two, we saw also that he is in control of his emotions. So he is one who is not going to be easily offended. He is one who is going to exercise self-control, and he is going to uh, forbear others, including their faults as well as their failures. Now, before I look at our new material here today, I want us to do a test, and I have to say I need you to be completely honest, okay? Uh, you cannot lie on the test. You cannot uh, cheat on the test. You cannot uh, tell me what you think I want to hear. I need you to be completely honest. And so we're going to do something here in just a moment. Now, what's weird is that I'm going to have you close your eyes in a moment. Now, that's not weird for some of you, uh, but what I do want you to do is open them back up, okay? That might be unusual, but uh, hopefully uh, we won't nod off asleep too quickly on that. Uh, but what we're going to do is here in just a moment, I'm going to have Jared put an image up on the screen, and what I want to know is the exact first thing that comes to your mind when you open your eyes and look at the screen. So I do not want to know the first thing that you see, such as the piano or uh, the organ or whatever. I want only the information on the screen, all right? But you got to be honest. So I want you to close your eyes. All the eyes are closed. We throw up the image. Now open your eyes. How many of you saw the white? Raise your hand. How many of you, first thing you saw was the dark spot? Okay. That's kind of a little shocking. I figured some of you would have, I figured there would be more who would see the white first. I'm by no means a psychologist, but isn't it interesting that out of, out of all of the white, we see one spot. When we think about our relationships with people, I'm not asking that we have some sort of a blind loyalty or that we in some way uh, just ignore things. I'm not suggesting that. But is it possible that in our relationships with people, what we actually see and focus on is more than negative Versus the positive. 
the ways that so-and-so irritates the fire out of me, the way that so-and-so never listens, the way that so-and-so always says these things. And before long, what we have allowed ourselves to do is become very focused on, in reality, a very small spot. There's a lot of good there. (laughs) There's a spot. What did Eve focus on in the garden? What did Satan get her to focus on? The one restriction that she had. They could eat, and I, we don't know how many trees there were, but to think that God didn't give sufficient and then some is contrary to how God works. They had an abundance of trees from which they could eat. But there was one restriction which they were to avoid, and it was that very restriction that caused Satan, or that Satan rather, honed in on and forced Eve to get to begin to consider. And as we look at this aspect of our disposition, So many times we allow our relationships to be adversely affected because what we choose to look at is the one thing, the flaws and the faults. And by the way, we realize there's more than one thing, okay? If we could sit here today and say, well... You know, if you're looking at my flaws, you're only looking at the one flaw that I have. Okay, well, we know that's not the case, all right? There, there are going to be many more flaws. If I put my life up there, you might reverse this with one little white dot in the middle, all right? And uh, that, that would probably be a little bit more accurate of a picture. But my point is that isn't interesting how that oftentimes we can naturally begin to focus on these things that capture the attention. And even as that image has stayed up there, you still would have to make a conscious effort, I would dare say, to not look at that spot that is in the middle, okay? And by the way, it is perfectly centered. And so uh, it was like, uh, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things. Now, I, I could maybe drive you crazy if I moved it off center. Some of you would be like, okay, yeah, that's not... That's not possible, okay? The, the ones who can't end on a gas pump on odd numbers. Uh, one of them, <laughs> look at how many times it's like, how many times have you gone from, well, it used to be like $25 to fill it, all right? Okay, we'll, we'll go back to the good old days. And you hit 2501, so you just went on up to 26, hoping you could get to 26. It doesn't take much to get up past a dollar now, uh, but I've had the uh, one of the, well, the Suburban I typically drive, I think they have one of the pumps at, at the uh, Shell just down the road stops, I think it's like 35 gallons. Okay, I've had, you know, like $101.71 and 35 gallons. It's like every negative and odd number possible is right there. It, nothing can round and the pump shuts off because you can't go any further. And it's like, oh, well, that's close enough to full now. And so it is what it is. All right. When you, when you look at all of people and you look at the tendencies that we have, think about how your mindset affects your disposition. There are times... When somebody, perhaps, that you struggle to get along with could come up and give you a thousand dollars and you'd still complain about how they handed it to you. It's something. Okay. Do what? Yeah, Don, Don is going to test it, Cecil's going to test it, $2,000 are now out, uh, but it's like, isn't it interesting, it's like, okay, so uh, someone, you know, I don't know, they, they win the lottery, now they, gotta, they grumble about the taxes, I'll tell you what, give me the billion dollars, I'll pay your taxes for you, okay, it, it's, it's how we are, are sometimes governed and, and sometimes how we function, and so when we, we look at these tendencies, we need to 
look in ourselves and say, wait a minute, is it possible that I have become so focused on that dot that that dot, man, it's driving me crazy because that thing's all I can see. Let your moderation be known unto all men. All right, before we get on, any thoughts that we want to say some? Her soul black screen, but my eyes focused on God. Okay. I see the God, but I seen the screen. Wow. All right. So Cecil acknowledges that my first thing was the white screen, and then I, my focus becomes on the little dot. Uh, I I would I know I would fail the test. Okay. I'll look at the dot right away, um, and and that's that's what I end up often saying. Yeah, I did. I led you to the belief. Yeah, what were you expecting? A big picture? Okay. Uh, mountains, maybe. Who knows what? Uh, a big bass coming up out of the lake. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, that is an excellent point. Yeah. That is an excellent point. I, I led you in a way to think that, and this wasn't even, Dale's going to preach this lesson. Dale, go ahead. I'm teasing. Yeah, no, I'm teasing. Uh, that is an excellent point. Dale said, all right, look, I, I led you to think there was going to be some sort of an image, and there really wasn't an image. And isn't it interesting how that we can lead someone else to think a negative conclusion or a actually perhaps create a negative disposition in someone just simply by how we function. Now think about our conversations with people. Think about our conversations around a dinner table. Uh, we let our hair down, so to speak, and uh, before long, our conversations turn very negative, and we're talking about so-and-so, and before long, everything is geared towards this. This is not healthy, and this is exactly what we're being told not to do here in Philippians chapter 4 uh, and verse number 5. Uh, Facebook question, is marriage different? Uh, I, I would say it's absolutely not different. It's much the same in the sense that uh, we can focus on a spouse's negativity and the negative qualities, and before long that spouse can't do anything right. And uh, they can't even vacuum the carpet in the right direction because they make the carpet go one way and it's supposed to go the other way. There's an easy way to fix that. I just won't vacuum. Here it is. Okay? Uh, and, and, and so th there are mindsets now sometimes that we end up having on these things. And before long, uh, we've allowed ourselves to, to kind of go the wrong direction. Sarah? Oh, you don't have a point. Putting up a window, okay. Yeah, all right. It's comical to watch. You guys should just be from my perspective sometimes to see different reactions. I see elbows and nods and, and rib jabs and, and people roll up windows and so it goes up. There's a division now and, and uh, it's all sorts of things that happen when I preach. All right, let's move on in our outline though because there are some additional points I want us to note. All right, what does this person look like? Number three, he recognizes the necessity of balance. I think that there is a sense in which um, we describe a person who is going to allow this disposition to come out. He recognizes the importance of balance. What happens when we go to extremes? Most often, you come to a lot of faulty conclusions on things, okay? Uh, you make the same what you never do this. You always do this, okay? And, and we, you always say that, okay? Well, that's starting to go down uh, an extreme. We also recognize that in the, in the grand scheme of things, what is it that is really important? Is it the most important thing that I, I accomplish, what I wanted to accomplish, the way I wanted to accomplish it, and the time I wanted to accomplish it, or is it possible that I am better off to just simply recognize, you know what, there are times where in the grand scheme of things, what we're arguing about right here is really not that important. How many times have we emphasize things that scripture does not emphasize and in doing so create 
unnecessary division. I think there are times where we see it all throughout that we unfortunately emphasize uh, the wrong things and minimize the wrong things as well. There's a balance there. What I have generally found is that people who get extreme in theology are oftentimes wrong. Uh, I found that people who are extreme in their reactions are oftentimes wrong. There's a balance that needs to be there. And I think that the person who is going to reflect this kind of a disposition recognizes the importance of balance and recognizes, okay, I need to conduct myself this way. Maybe my emotions today, for whatever reason, are on the edge, all right? Then I need to recognize that and I need to try to bring this back to where it needs to be. Let's move on, number four. He understands the urgency of moderation. Verse 5, the command, let your moderation be known unto all men, uh, is a command that suggests the nature of the way in which it is structured, says this is something that is urgent, this is something that needs to be undertaken at once. Now, the book of Philippians was a book that was obviously written to a group of Christians living in the city of Philippi. There were problems in this church. It was a church that had a very close relationship with Paul, and it is a church that is the theme of much of this letter is on the aspects of joy and so forth. However, it was not a perfect church. And there were some divisions that appear to me to be the result of individuals who were insisting on their own rights and on their own uh, matters at hand. And the problem was that that insistence was creating a corporate problem. And Paul, one of the things that he corrects in this particular letter is this problem that is here. And for the sake of the gospel, which I personally believe that's the theme more of Philippians, but for the sake of the gospel, this church needed to get it right and get it right now. You understand? And, and this, think if we took our relationships this way and said, okay, you know what? Um, because I recognize the impact of my attitude on the cause of Jesus Christ, I'm going to change that and I'm going to change it now. That's the sense of what Paul is saying here. And boy, that's not typically what we do. Typically what we do is say, you know what? That person has a bad attitude and they need to fix it. <laughs> now they might have a bad attitude, and they might need to fix it. So might I. And the way in which I'm sharing that would certainly suggest that I perhaps have a problem as well. And when we begin to insist on matters that I would say, and I think is probably the case here, though we're not specifically told, but it, there's nothing doctrinal that is corrected here in, at the church in Philippi. So it would seem to me that this is more personal, maybe matters of little significance, and we're going to insist on that. It's like, okay, is it really that important? Um, I can remember growing up, silverware used to be set a certain way on a dinner table. Now... Um, it still is informal meals, but if you come to my house, it's plopped down on the table. I don't, I couldn't tell you the forks on the right or on the left. I don't care. I just need a fork or a spoon, something that I can use to eat, okay? Okay. There are Christians who would be so pedantic over things that if that fork were on the wrong side of the plate, they're not eating. To which I say, great, it's more for me. Okay? Uh, my point is, here's something that has absolutely no significance. Did I see a hand? I thought I saw a hand out of my corner of my eye. I didn't. Dale? To them. No. 
I'm just a porter. <laughs> and then there's a certain way to do things. So you can't change some things that are within order, even though that is so normal. Okay, God is a God of order. Is God such a God of order that he mandates the fork be on the right side of the plate? No. Though in some cases, uh, we may look at other things and we could say, well, all right, well, uh, let's take a look at how church is to be conducted. And this is where we find this in 1 Corinthians 14. Let all things be done decently and in order. Why? Because God is not the author of confusion. Now, the problem there in the context is you've got people who are exercising tongues with no interpretation of tongues. So it's no benefit. And it, be, it, it created a chaotic scene of worship. That is a different situation than the fork on the one side of the table. Does that mean details are unimportant? No, it does not, because God is clearly... Uh, a God of details. However, as believers, we also have to recognize that there is a sense in which I'm going to recognize, okay, what is important and what is not important? What is something that is uh, of significance that I need to maintain and what are things that I can simply avoid? Personally, I just want to eat. Okay, uh, I'll even grab my own fork. That's fine. Uh, but I, I, I'm going to focus on it that way. Sarah? I think that's important to understand that about Works are really not that important. There are things that will be important to other people that you don't think are important. Right. So sometimes in service, like the habit, I guess, is to just say that, well, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that important. Okay, well, that's a little detail that for you may not be important, but for me, when I look at this, that's all I'm going to see. If your thought was off by a centimeter, that would have been all I saw. Right. So it wouldn't have been that important to you because it's close enough, but to me, it would have been. Yeah, so uh, something that is important to someone else but may not be to me. All right, I'll give another illustration for Sarah that would be kind of a comical one. Uh, she, when she eats her Skittles, she's going to eat them based on color, okay? If I want to irritate her, I'll grab a handful, and even Heather's sitting here going, no, you can't do that, okay? And just put them all in my mouth at the same time, okay? And, and I know that with her, it's just like... Ah. I, I can't even be around you anymore right now uh, because you have just taken and done the cardinal rule of blending all of the Skittles together. And, and you, you just can't do that. Or uh, fruit salad, and, and you work your way through each individual piece of fruit, which I will sometimes do, sometimes I don't. Uh, and it's like, okay, well, uh, all right, now I'm going to eat all these, and I'm going to eat all my apples, and I'm going to eat all my grapes, and I'm, I'm going to save the strawberries for the last because that's by far the best. And so I'm going to work my way through this and whatever I don't like first okay sometimes I do that sometimes I could care less because I just want to eat uh, but it's interesting and, and there does in, in this mindset though and I think what what we're while we're taking some comical approaches to this I think there is an importance of saying I need to be conscious of others which is what we're also establishing here in this now the flip side of this is sometimes I need to recognize that the standard that I'm holding to is really a little bit of an extreme standard and should not be held to the point that I'm expecting everyone else to hold to this particular standard Becca I don't think it's really part of the problem here. Is this a preference or is this a, a, a doctrinal, a biblical issue that would be more in the lines of a conviction? And we have to recognize the sermon between them. Grant? Maybe a call should be respected, but you don't need to make an issue out of it. Okay, that's a great point as well. Trivial things I think should be respected, but we don't have to necessarily make uh, a huge issue over them. Amy? Yeah, I think that's probably that somewhat depending on what it is, that Christian memory principle of you know, by insisting upon my informality, if I'm going to be offensive to someone, then, you know, I can step up my game or, or whatever. I know, like, even in the church of mom, even though I speak in a virgin situation, at that table, it's still a very big deal to her. So yeah. when we had family dinner, we set the table because it mattered to her. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's, a, it's how I view people, and um, sometimes... Their insistence is a hassle because it causes you to have to. And so I think it's just how we do things. And, and if my goal is to glorify Christ and to minister to others, then it, it should all balance out. Okay, very good. Cecil? Uh, I guess.
guess what I've got to say is going to bring it to the personal level to the people involved here. You, you come into church and you've got your place that you normally sit and that your, you take in as your sitting there. Yeah. What if you come in and somebody's took that position yeah. and you have to sit somewhere else? Are you going to lose focus on the Lord's work in the study because you're focusing on that person who's got my seat? Yeah. Are so, you going to take the, the, the thing is, are you going to take learning what God's got to teach you out of the thing because you're not where you want to be? So, uh, a comical scene almost, and, and everyone does. We've, we've got our own spots where we're going to sit. Uh, what if someone else is taking your spot? I, I actually was in a church one time where uh, we were um, insanely uh, crammed in a very small area. And bless her heart, the dear old saint was not about to move. And she informed us she was not about to move. And it's like, okay, you know, um, yeah, it's, there, there was plenty of room. But anyways, this was not an option. This, and, and I was told this is not an option. It's okay, we'll take all five of us, two of them be on our laps, and we'll sit here and enjoy it. Well, I knew the pastor of the church well, and um, anyway, was actually asked to go up and pray. In that process, he shared, I was pastoring here, and yada, yada, yada. When I came back down, oh, you can have as much room as you want. (laughs) And it's like, well, isn't that an interesting thing? Old Joe Blow comes in off the street, and there's no room for him. But the preacher will make room for him. Uh, Boy, I'll tell you what, that... Oh, never. Yeah, the Bible does talk about that, where the rich men come in and they're given the preference seats. That ought never characterize us as a church. Let's move on. Number five, this individual is also motivated by things of eternal significance. The Bible tells us, be, let your moderation be known unto all men, men being uh, there. Uh, I think it's just unto all. I'd have to look at it in the Greek text. But anyway. Here's the reason for that. Here's the motivation. The Lord is at hand. What it does is it takes and, and puts things into the proper scheme of what it is that is truly important and what it is that is not. It's a recognition that the return of the Lord is imminent. And therefore, I'm going to choose to act accordingly. I sure would be hating going on and on and on about somebody and the Lord to return. (laughs) It certainly puts it into the perspective that maybe the things that we want to emphasize are things that that we really should not emphasize. All right, let's turn over to Romans chapter 14, and I want us now to look at our fourth point on this. I really would like to try to get through this if we can. If not, that's fine as well. Romans 14, I want us to see the practice of moderation. What does this look like in practice? We find a a situation in Romans chapter 14 that is often described as Christian liberty. Now, there is a sense in which um, this, I think, as a concept has become greatly abused and misunderstood. And I think Paul is going to clarify this for us quite a bit in Romans chapter 14. Um, We are not talking about the same thing that 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10 talks about where you are going to attend a feast in an idol's temple. Uh, Paul clearly forbids that in that chapter. They still, however, do we have to follow the Jewish laws and the Jewish restrictions? Am I permitted? What what are the dietary restrictions? There were differences of opinion on these things. Um, And is it okay for me to eat? And Paul does address this in that section in 1 Corinthians. Is it okay for me to eat meat that has been offered to idols? And Paul's point was, if you are unaware of it, then then just eat it and don't ask the questions was, was what Paul said. Now, if I'm going to take, and this 
inner disposition is going to be proper, then, then what's it going to look like in my practice? Well, we find several principles, and again, I'm not going to get into an exhaustive study of Romans chapter 14 here this morning, but we find several principles that I think give us some insight. Number one, accept diversity of opinion. Romans 14, the first three verses describe individuals, one who according to verse 2 believes he can eat all things and another, according to verse 2, who is described as weak and only able to eat herbs. Now, again, my purpose is not to try to describe and characterize everything that is going on. Let's look at this from a broader perspective. It's clear when you're talking about meat versus herbs, these are not matters of biblical truth or doctrine. We are talking about matters on which scripture truly is silent if and and i mean you look at the book of romans you look at the books of uh, galatians for example galatians does not permit doctrinal error okay all you have to do is read the first six verses seven verses of galatians one and you understand quickly paul is not happy because they've accepted some wrong doctrine that's not what we're talking about in romans chapter 14. what about differences of opinions let me just say this learn to accept diverse opinions they are beneficial they can be sharpening and they can be refining. Someone may have a better idea than you. And it's shocking. It's possible. Okay? I know that it might not be probable, but it is possible. Their idea can refine your idea. Um, The professor that I just went to his his wife's funeral on Thursday, there was a a time in, in one of the classes that um, we were going through preparing sermons and, and, and part of that was that there would be a point where we would just kind of say whatever, you know, having understood the meaning of the text, now, okay, now what are some of the things that we're seeing in that text? And, and I made a point that was a debated point. I still, uh, to this day, would hold to that position. But nonetheless, um, it, no one else did in the class. I'm not sure what the professor actually held to, but it didn't matter. We were just kind of sparring a little bit back and forth, not in an improper way. And I, I wanted to say that was on a Monday, and we left class laughing. You know, everyone's calling me the heretic and, and yada, yada, yada. Wednesday, I came back into a peculiar arrangement, and that was the one chair here and the other chairs in a semicircle. And, and my professor, Dr. Surratt, said, this is your chair here in the middle, and you're going to debate your position. There was no heads up on it. There was no additional thought. I didn't have a chance to prepare or anything like that. And then I heard different ideas that were out there, and, and I was asked, you know, why my position and so forth. And my position was that all Christians love God. And it was actually out of James where the Bible talks about the individual who endures temptation, uh, endures the testing, is going to receive the crown of life. It's promised to them that love him. And I said, this is something that's to all believers. Oh, no, 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 you you don't love God. And it's like, no, we're not talking about loving God as you should. But is it true that all Christians love God? Well, to me, the answer is yes, because in 1 Corinthians it says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ... He is an athme, he's accursed. So I'm saying yes, 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 and they're saying no, 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 no. Okay, well, in this process, my thinking actually became more refined. And in that little debate, for which there was absolutely no preparation, then I said this, if you are going to hold that James chapter 1 and verse 12 is not to all believers, then you're going to have to say Romans 8, 28 isn't applicable to all believers because we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. God. Now all of a sudden they had an issue. The diversity of opinion is not a bad thing. I will say this, unity of spirit is not uniformity of opinion. Okay? Unity of spirit is not uniformity of opinion. I don't ask you to always think the way I think. 
If you express a disagreeing opinion, I only ask that you do so kindly. Okay? Otherwise, I battle my flesh, and then we're both going to have problems. So, uh, let's, but let's understand. Okay, listen, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It just means we've got a difference of opinion on this. And I don't know where it happened, but for whatever reason, far too many Christians are incapable of accepting this. It's like, well, you know what? I disagree. I'm gone. Psh. It's like, really? Well, whatever happened to being able to say, you know what? I just disagree with you on that. Okay, fine. <laughs> I might change my mind. You might change your mind. But for whatever reason, oftentimes this does not happen. Number two, embrace divine accountability. If I'm going to practice moderation, then I'm going to have to recognize that I stand before God and you will stand before God. Verse 4 of Romans 14, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now he goes on and he explains, okay, we got one guy who regards this day, probably a holy day or a Sabbath day, and he does it to the Lord. Another guy who says, well, you can't eat, and so he eat herbs, he does that to God. Verse 7, none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. All the way down to verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself before God. Okay, guess what? You're going to stand before God, for what you believe, and I'm going to stand before God before what I believe. When I understand that, and when you understand that, then you're going to say, you know what, Dan's opinion really isn't that big of a deal, because I'm going to stand before God. Yeah, absolutely. And guess what I'm going to say? Your opinion really isn't that big of a deal, because I'm going to stand before God. There are people that say, well, uh, you need to run your church service a little bit differently. Okay, fine. You know what? I'm going to stand before God for that. Okay? Well, I think, I think your Sunday morning messages need to be structured this way. You know what? I'm going to stand before God for that. You're not. I am. And with all due respect, his opinion matters a lot more. Okay? And what he has shared in the Word of God matters a lot more. And so we, we get into these things, and what we have to recognize, and he alludes to this phrase, um, to be fully persuaded uh, in our own minds. Why? Because the reality is that we are simply going to one day uh, give an account of ourselves before God. All right, let's move on, Grant, quickly. Yeah, correct. Well, I think sometimes we're dogmatic on the wrong things, uh, and, and we, we really miss the we really missed the point. Uh, number three, we need to learn to achieve the right objective. What, am I, what do I really want? If I'm practicing moderation and I'm exemplifying this, what is it that I really want? Do I just want to prove that I'm right? Sometimes that's the way it is. Do I just want to prove that so-and-so is wrong? And sometimes we get a lot of satisfaction out of that. Or... Do I just want to glorify God? That needs to be the case. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, do all to the glory of God. So let me ask you this, a couple of questions. At what point do we stop insisting on our opinion being right? Why is our viewpoint the only acceptable one? It necessitates that proper priorities be established, and it necessitates humility, not insistence upon my way. Number four, let's quickly address two more points. Accept diversity of people. In our text in Philippians chapter 4, let your moderation be known unto most men. <laughs> All men. Not most, not some, all. That means those with whom I get along and those with whom I do not. That even extends to unbelievers. First Peter chapter 2, servants are commanded to be subject to in their masters, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the forward, the unsaved, the, those who are perverse. James chapter 3, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, 
gentle and easy to be entreated. Uh, goes on and lists some other things. Point is that we have to learn to accept others, including the mistakes that they may be made in their lives. I was reading an article just uh, the other day, and, and the statement was, God's love is bigger than our mistakes. Okay? And it is. Let's move on. Number five, I would have to learn to exercise self-restraint. You know, sometimes it might be self-restraint with a positive. It might also be self-restraint with a negative. Sometimes I'll have to practice not doing certain things. <laughs> and sometimes I'll have to practice doing certain things. Let me just give you a few references. First Peter chapter 2, Jesus Christ also suffered for us, leaving us for an example that ye should follow in his steps who did no sin, Neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. He did not do certain things. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 16. Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee. <laughs> for me, it would be, hast thou found chocolate? <laughs> Don't eat too much, lest thou be filled therewith and vomited. Have you ever done that as a kid? Oh, as an adult, say, like, oh, it just looks so good. And then a little while later, okay, self-restraint. Proverbs 9, verse 8, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. You know how hard it is to not reprove someone who's doing wrong? What about when it's your child? Sometimes there's the need to exercise the restraint. And I have to learn... I'm going to take biblical stands, but I've got to do so with a biblical demeanor. We've held it past just a little bit. Let me close with a word of prayer, and we'll go on. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Pray your blessings here in our service to follow. Thank you for this time. Lord, would you give us uh, more sensitive hearts, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless. I'll see you back here in a few minutes.